Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. So what's the difference between psychotherapy and Eastern wisdom traditions or contemplative practices? Welcome to episode number 88. Today, I'm sitting down with Dr. Roger Walsh. We're going to dive deep into the Western tradition and science of psychotherapy with pioneers such as Freud and Jung. And then also look at the difference and compare with the Eastern wisdom traditions or contemplative practices of, say, someone like Gautama the Buddha, who was called the great physician. Is there an overlapping? Was Buddha the first therapist? We're also going to touch on the mystical experiences of using plant-based medicine or psychedelics versus someone experiencing a satori. So sit down, relax, and take in this beautiful recording. Dr. Walsh, welcome to the Inner Peace Podcast. Kevin, thanks so much. Do you think in your experience that psychiatry can go as deep as the wisdom traditions and practices such as meditation and self-inquiry? There are various dimensions or developmental lines of of maturation that people can grow through. And uh, psychotherapy, which is the primary therapeutic tool of psychiatry, setting aside medications for the moment, we can come back to those if you'd like, and meditation contemplative traditions have some overlap, but they also tend to focus on somewhat different capacities. And traditionally, psychotherapy has been used for healing and bringing people back towards the norm. Mm. And contemplative practices have been taking people who are already, you know, supposedly fairly well adjusted and moving them into transpersonal states and stages. So their aims have been somewhat different. Of late, we've seen an interesting merger between the two as much as some forms of psychotherapy have incorporated elements of the contemplative traditions some psychotherapies and parts of psychiatry and psychology have acknowledged that there are so-called post-conventional or transpersonal states and stages available to us and have begun to uh, work to foster some of those. So we're seeing an interesting merger of the two traditions at this time. And fascinating, given that these two traditions, the psychological and the contemplative, developed the centuries largely in separation from one another, and now they're coming together. Yeah, I, I think of someone like Carl Jung. He he definitely you know went into the realms of mysticism. I mean, he did forwards for many Eastern tradition books. The Secret of the Golden Flower comes to mind. So he kind of had both sides going on too. So he was kind of merging them, but he he never really took it all the way, so to speak, with meditation and contemplation, did he? He just kind of grasp over the surface of it? Well, he certainly, as you said, pioneered some fascinating forays into the transpersonal arena and was himself uh, obviously a gifted uh, visionary in many ways. <laughs> and I think you point to an interesting facet of his work that he was uh, way ahead of his time in opening to visionary experiences. And instead of just dismissing them as either pathology or disordered neuronal fireworks, recognized that they could be uh, mediators or transmitters of symbolic wisdom of a profound and informational kind. And so he really opened in the West the you know, so called imaginal realm, the, the realm of vision or archetype or imagery, uh, which has been a part of the contemplative world. But Jung was really a pioneer in bringing this to the forefront of 
Western psychology and psychiatry. Now, of course, he's remained somewhat out, out of the mainstream, but he's certainly made an important contribution there. But then the other, there's the other aspect that you pointed to, Kevin, which is that he stayed at that level. He stayed at the level of the imaginal, the, the visionary, the, the, of image and images and symbol, symbolism. And yet the great contemplative traditions tend to push past that. Yes, some of them acknowledge, for example, Tibetan Buddhism makes enormous use of symbols and imagery and has very sophisticated imaginal practices. But they also point through the images. And at their best, the, image, the images are as what, what Joseph Campbell said, transparent to the transcendent. That is, they point beyond themselves to the transcendent. Mm. And that transcendent eventually becomes transimaginal, transrational, transconceptual, goes beyond concepts, images, ideas, into the realm of formless awareness, pure awareness, transcendent to all thought, all imagery, all mental content of any kind. So that Jung did not go there, you're right. Is it safe to say that Freud didn't go even close to that? <laughs> well, Freud, uh, Freud was a pioneer in his own time, but I think from our contemporary perspective, we can say that he tended to over-pathologize. That is, understandably, his focus and most of psychiatry's focus has been on pathology and remediating it. There's a problem that uh, sociologists point which they call professional deformation. That is, every profession both informs and deforms its practitioners. And in psychiatry, and particularly for Freud, one of the traps of uh, professional deformation is an over-pathologizing perspective, a tendency to view a lot of psychological function uh, in pathological terms. So for Jung, the mystical experience is a sense of unity or oneness he interpreted it as a regression rather than a progression. And it makes sense if you think of the three broad spheres of human development. We go, we come into the world of the so-called pre-conventional, pre-conceptual, pre-rational stage. We don't have thought, we don't have concepts, we don't, don't have a sense of self. So it's, it's pre-personal also. But then as we mature, we develop a sense of, a, a sense of self or ego. We develop concepts, we learn how to work with language and images. So we develop, we are at the, then the conceptual, or rational, or personal level. But it's only quite recently in the last few decades, particularly since the influx of contemplative traditions into the West and rediscovery of our own Western contemplative traditions, that we've begun to appreciate that there are developmental stages beyond the, the conventional, beyond the rational, conceptual, or self into the transpersonal, transrational, transpersonal, mm. or post-conventional states and stages. And Freud just wasn't aware of the post-conventional, which is not surprising. Almost no one was at that stage in the world. Right. So he tended, if you've only got pre-personal or pre-conventional and conventional, then everything's got to fit into those two. If it's not conventional and rational, then it's pre-conventional, pre-rational, i.e. regressive. So that was, mm. he made what's called the pre-trans fallacy, he confused trans-rational experiences with pre-rational ones. And you know, Stacey, he was still a pioneer, but uh, he had a limited map. And of course, in 50 years from now, our maps will probably be pretty limited too. Let's go, let's go back, you know, almost 2,600 years ago. What about Gautama, the Buddha? Many people, if the reports are correct, could say that he is the pioneer of therapy. He is the greatest therapist or doctor or scientist. In fact, I believe he referred to himself as a physician. I almost feel like Freud or whoever is almost sometimes teaching a, a, an Eastern Buddhist way, you know, almost like the West just didn't want to pay attention to this guy 2,600 years ago and just invented something that was maybe already there. 
Well, there are certainly overlaps between some of the uh, Western psychological pioneers and and the great contemplative sages like like the Buddha or Lao Tzu or or Mencius or any number of other sages we could we can name from multiple traditions, uh, and they have their differences. Uh, you know, clearly, and you, yes, you're right. The Buddha was referred to as the great physician who diagnosed our human condition, you know, that we are prone to unenlightened living as just suffering as part of unenlightened living. And the cause of that is craving. Uh, and the way out is to relinquish craving. And here's how you do it. The Eightfold Path, live mm -hmm. in a ethically, uh, you know, learn to concentrate. De develop a deep insight and understanding, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's one one path now. And to what extent is that? Does that overlap with uh, some of the Western pioneers? Well, uh, Freud himself acknowledged that there was there was a convergence in that both psychoanalysis and the contemplative traditions aimed at deep introspection and self-examination. But he also pointed out that they used different methods. Well, the contemplative practices primarily use direct, self-directed introspection. Psychotherapies employ a relationship as the instrument for introspection, guidance, a, a close guidance and interaction with another person. And each brings out different things. Psychotherapy, for example, uh, if, if you look at the Buddhist teachings, you find nothing about nothing significant about psychological defenses, right. about repression, denial, projection. Yeah, you find hints of it, but Western psych psychotherapy mapped those, has mapped those out with great precision. Likewise, the Buddha was brilliant on the power of thoughts. In fact, the opening opening lines of the Dharma Pada, one of the core collection of Buddhist, the Buddhist sayings begins with the words, and I just love these, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts, with our thoughts we make our world. Now that's masterful cognitive therapy, and contemporary cognitive therapists have mapped out the variety of so-called cognitive distortions, particular kinds of disordered thinking that you never find in Buddhism. For example, in depression, you find three so-called cognitive triad of depression. The depressive tends to think everything's awful, I'm bad, and it's always gonna be like that way. Negative beliefs about the world, about myself, and about time. But you never find that kind of precision in, in the Buddhist analyses or because those things are more easily recognized by another person. You know, Jesus asked, you know, once you see the blog in your own eye rather than just the speck in your neighbors, well, the answer is pretty simple now that we know about psychological defenses is because we're defended against recognizing our own, our own blind spots, but, but others can see them very easily. So psychotherapy allows us to, re with the help of another person to recognize some of the defenses and blocks that we're just blind to ourselves. So I, I, what I would want to point to is the, is the complementarity of these approaches. You know, the Western therapies just have not developed concentration or insight to the level that the contemplative traditions have. Mm -hmm. And so the, so this is the first time in history we have the possibility of drawing from the wisdom of both these traditions and, and being the beneficiaries of two streams of wisdom and insight and exploration of the mind and how to help and heal it and actualize it, even transcend it. Uh, and we're the beneficiaries for the first time in history. Mm. I'm fascinated with all this because... Uh, I was seeing a therapist back in the day. I, I did therapy for five years. No mental illness or anything, just a regular dude complaining. <laughs> well, as my late wife used to say, you don't, you don't have to be sick to be, get better. I ended up 
getting frustrated with it because I felt like I was coming in. It was the same thing all the time. And, you know, it could have been the therapist or whatever. It became very mundane. And, you know, I became friendly with the guy, you know, like an older brother type, you know, and, uh, but yeah, I almost felt like he needed therapy. <laughs> oh, and, probably so. <laughs> Most of us do. And um, I ended up getting into, you know, Eastern traditions and mysticism. And I ended up feeling great relief from that, including Gautama the Buddha. I ended up having a few satori's and experiences and being like, you know, this is this is what I was looking for my whole life right here. And beautiful. I you know, I had you know, I had to break up with them. <laughs> and I was like, look, I'm just gonna go the spiritual path and uh, you know, I've been I've been good ever ever since. That's why I'm so intrigued by talking with you. You have knowledge on both sides and you're able to bring that together. And, you know, I felt like if, if I had walked back into that office and I had explained to him what happened to me, I don't think he would have been able to handle it. Well, it's possible. Uh, most therapists until quite recently just haven't been familiar with contemplative practice. So uh, that's changing. Uh, now meditation is now the most researched of all psychotherapies with, uh, with the widest range of demonstrated benefits, ranging across physiological, physical, psychological, uh, perceptual, developmental. So over 6,000 research studies on meditation alone, way more than any therapy. So, Times have changed, and yeah, mindfulness is the key word now, right? Mindfulness. Yeah, mindfulness is all over the place. As Jack Kornfield, who's one of the world's best-known meditation teachers, said, he went to a con psychotherapy conference, and the amount of mindfulness was nauseating. <laughs> so it's, you can't escape it these days, and that's wonderful. A lot of us, myself included, worked very hard to introduce mindfulness and other practices into into the West, and. Uh, and it's wonderful that it's now mainstream and, and clearly dem demonstrably very effective for a variety of psychological disorders. And there are some traps with that. One is that the higher reaches of possibilities for these practices are being overlooked. They're being used to reduce anxiety and blood pressure and not for enlightenment, awakening, satori, salvation, moksha, fana, et cetera, et cetera. So the higher reaches are being overlooked. And the variety of practices are being overlooked. You know, there are hundreds of different thousands, actually, of different kinds of meditation, all sorts of capacities for developing lucid dreaming or lucidity mm -hmm. awareness, even when you're not dreaming during sleep, and for, for cultivating love and compassion and joy and empathy, and on and on and on and on. So, there's just a rich array which we're just beginning to tap into. So. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's beginning to happen, which is wonderful. What about, how, how does the therapist handle mystical experiences? And, and what about, like, I've had a lot of guests on this podcast, mediums. I've had people who, you know, claim to have guides. If people who soul travel, out-of-body travel. You know, of course, tons of Satori stories, of course. And, you know, I, I've had near-death experience people come on and talk about all sorts of things. What does the, what, how does the therapist, the psychiatrist or psychologist, how do they handle that when somebody comes in and says, hey, I had this experience? Well, of course, First off, it will depend on the therapist sure. and how much understanding of these things they have and how much exposure they have. And historically, they would have, would have handled it not very well. Mm. And at, at, at the worst, the worst of psychiatry and psychotherapy, they would have pathologized those experiences and, and said that's a sign of regression or pathology or a problem. Stop, stop the meditation, et cetera, et cetera. Now they're much more better known, they're much better understood. 
they're more appreciated. So now uh, you, I think you'll still get a range of responses from some very traditional psychiatrists who don't really have much experience or exposure to any of these things. And they'll probably just scratch their head and say, okay, well, I understand these can be helpful. So, okay, mm. good luck. And others who are deeply interested and have a contemplative practice themselves, maybe having some of the kind, same kind of experiences as the people who walk into their office. And there, there can be a very useful dialogue and a very rich uh, exploration of the implications and significance of further potentials to these experiences. Mm. So, you know, one of the first things, if a person's looking for therapy, interview the therapist, find out whether it's a good match. You know, one of the great tragedies most people looking for psychotherapy is that they just hook up with the first person they walk into. It's like marrying the first person you date. Right. It's like, it's like, you know, you're the consumer, you have the right to interview the therapist and check them out. And the most important determinant of all for a psychotherapeutic outcome is the quality of the relationship. Do you feel really good with this person? Does it feel like a match? Do they feel like they get you? Mm. If they don't, well, thanks, it was nice. Uh, I think I'm gonna look elsewhere. But if you find someone it works for, and I was very fortunate in finding that, finding a person who really, just blew my, changed my life totally. And I had kind of the opposite experience of yours. I just, it, I just walked out a couple of years later and my life was turned totally around. I realized there was an inner universe as vast and mysterious as the outer, which I'd had no idea even existed. I felt like I'd lived the entire, my entire life on the top six inches of a wave on top of an ocean I didn't even know existed. Mm. And my therapist opened that inner world to me, pointed me to it, showed me how to draw on the inner resources of insight and understanding and guidance that all of us have available to us, but most of us in this culture don't know about. And how long ago was that? More years than I care to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Before you... 30 years. Right. Okay. Uh, and and he was the reason I got into these contemplative practices because once I saw there was an inner universe, then I started looking around for other ways of exploring them. But if mm. I hadn't had that therapy, yeah, it would never have happened. You had the other kind of a very interesting variation on that. The therapy wasn't working so well for you, so you went looking elsewhere. So, so you had the right guy at the right time. I had the right guy. I was very very fortunate. I had a master therapist. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned the uh, contemplation. A lot of people don't know what contemplation is. It sometimes is thrown around like a slang word, you know. So, how would you describe to someone uh, that's confused as to what a contemplative practice is? Well, you're right, Kevin. Contemplation is a is a broad uh, concept, and it covers a variety of practices spanning meditation and yoga any of the practices which systematically cultivate attention and awareness for introspection and psychological and spiritual growth. So that's the, that's the broad picture of what contemplative practices are. Then you have various kinds. You have the meditative traditions, which are the ones which specifically focus on attention, on refining attention, perception, awareness, uh, and particularly looking within to see how the mind works and how it can be cultivated and trained and developed. And then you have the yogas, which include meditation, but also include an array of other lifestyle practices such as diet and, and for example, body postures as in Hatha yoga and, uh, and working with energy and breath so as to refine the psychophysiology in ways which are both supportive and and conducive to uh, psychological and spiritual maturation. Mm. Would you consider self-inquiry under that umbrella of contemplative? Uh, certainly can be. Self-inquiry can be of various kinds. It can range all the way from uh, keeping a diary you know, or journaling, which is a very effective technique through to reflection on experiences, through to 
more meditative, non-conceptual insight through to pure awareness. So you have a whole spectrum of self-insight practices. And of course, you know, we could think of therapies and relation and what a relationship with a good friend or counselor is, as a self-exploration. So it's, I think, again, it too, like contemplation is a generic term. Yeah. I love the example or the analogy you made about being six inches on top of the wave and not knowing that there's an and ocean. No clue. No clue. no clue. And none of us really do. Yeah, and our culture that's been, it's less so now, of course, but back when I was doing this, which was getting on towards 40 years ago, I was pretty young at the time, uh, you know, I felt very isolated because just in my medical world, I just couldn't find people to talk to. And there were some people who thought I was losing it. And so, yeah, but fortunately, fortunately now, of course, things are beginning to change. Yeah. So let's talk about states of consciousness. You just mentioned pure awareness. Pure awareness or pure consciousness. You know, these are big terms with big meaning. <laughs> Enlightenment, self-realization, things like this. A Satori, of course, is sort of a glimpse, an invitation into what they called in ancient times, enlightenment. What's happening scientifically with a self-realized person, someone who gets their mind to surrender and is very still and very silent? My assumption is, uh, is there's all, there are always psychological correlates to particular experiences. In fact, there are always neurological correlates to any particular experience too. So one of the fields of research these days is a mapping of the electrophysiological or EEG changes in the brain as people do contemplative practices and mature through various, uh, various states of consciousness. And so that's, that's obviously a relatively new field, but there's a significant amount of neurological data on the, on the changes that people undergo as they, as they do contemplative practices. Uh, and we also have phenomenological or so-called experiential reports from people as they mature through various states. So I think we're beginning to map these states in, ver in interesting ways, of course, the contemplative traditions themselves have very sophisticated maps of, of the states of consciousness that people mature through as they develop their, develop their contemplative practices. And each tradition has its um, own distinct map, developmental map, but you're, we're also seeing some people like Daniel Brown of uh, Harvard University uh, showing how these maps correlate uh, across traditions in interesting ways. So we're beginning to see the not only the we're, we're beginning to collect not only the individual maps from Christian contemplation and Jewish Kabbalah and, and Hindu yoga, etc. Neo-Confucian quiet sitting. We're also beginning to see how these maps correspond to one another in some very interesting ways. And we're beginning to get some psychological tests on people as they mature through these and we're beginning to get some neurological markers of the way the brain uh, function changes as people mature through these so it's a very interesting convergence from east to west from contempt from ancient and modern from from experiential to physiological all giving us coming together for the first time in history to begin to get a a synthesis and sense, a multi-dimensional sense of how these practices work and what they do. It's an exciting time. How can we get so scientific on, you know, the human body if if we're really formless? Yeah. Well, we you know we have have these bodies, and we have these brains, and we need them. 
to function in this realm. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, one of the deepest insights that occurs with contemplation can be the recognition of that uh, our deepest identity is a uh, is uh, pure awareness or consciousness or being or bliss or atman i mean many many different names given to it but uh, but then there's the even beyond the, that recognition is the integration of holding both the recognition of our deep identity and our incarnation manifestation and form is in, in these bodies and how to live that in, inside an experience in, in a given situation and condition and existential situ, situation as fully and effectively and benevolently as possible. So we're called to not just recognize the deepest awareness, which is no small achievement in itself, hmm. although it's not an achievement, it's a recognition, but then also to live that as wisely as we possibly can, going back to your original comment about wisdom. Mm. What are your thoughts on substances, plant substances, such as mushrooms that create a psychedelic experience? How, how would these states of consciousness compare to something such as a Satori? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. And I've been intrigued by that one for some time. Uh, the, uh, the, the question was formulated originally when psychedelics began to uh, be used widely in the culture by the great religious scholar Houston Smith, who wrote a very seminal article titled, Do Drugs Have Religious Import? And what he, the conclusion he came to was that uh, psychedelics of one kind or another could indeed elicit uh, profound religious experiences. But he said it's clear, and the way he summarized it was very intriguing. He said, it is clear that these chemicals can induce religious experiences. It's less clear that they can induce religious lives. Hmm. So, so he was pointing to something very important, there's, that there's a difference between a transient experience or a peak experience, as Maslow called it, and an in, enduring way of living or being. And as he summarized it in another article, the challenge is to transmute, transmute flashes of illumination into abiding life. So uh, if you look at the, and this fits perfectly with the contemplative traditions themselves. If you look across contemplative traditions, you find that there are actually three maps of maturation. The first map is from, uh, from our ordinary life to when we first get interested in contemplative practices, we increase our motivation and begin practicing. The first map maps those stages through to the first glimpse of our deeper or deeper nature. May it be called pure awareness, Christ consciousness, Fana, Ratman, you know, lots of different names, but all pointing to a deeper, deeper identity. So that's the first map, but then and that's the one most of us know about. But the se there's a second map. And the second map is one of stabilizing. So how do you take that very brief satori or glimpse or peak experience and extend it into a plateau experience? How do you transform an older state into an older trait, a, a, a glimpse into a way of living and being? That's the second stage map. And there are... And if you look across, look across traditions, you find ways of stabilizing that. For example, you, you begin your meditation sitting on a pillow under ideal conditions. But once you glimpse some of the deeper insights, then the task is to get off the cushion and maintain them. And, to, and one thing you can do is build a hierarchy of tasks from what's really easy, like just walking quietly in your living room to working at the computer. It's much harder to maintain clear, lucid awareness at your computer doing creative work than it is to just quietly walk through your living room. So that's the second map, that's stabilization. And then the third map, which is almost never heard of, is the map beyond, once, once there's stable awareness, a lot of people and traditions think that's the end, but other traditions will say, no, 
once you have stable awareness, for example, uh, once you can maintain awareness, say, 24 hours a day during waking, during sleeping, during non-dream sleep, then beyond that is further degrees of purification and clarification of, of, one's, of one's mind so as so that to, re, to remove, uh, they would claim, all karmic residues, conditioning in Western terms, uh, defilements in Buddhist terms, etc., etc., so as to be a, a really pure instrument of spirit in the world to bring those insights through a very clear, lucid vessel into to heal and to help and to and to teach in the world as effectively and fully and benevolently as possible. So, so that's the big picture on on the the possibilities of development in that stage, you can see that the, the psychedelics for the most part have their role in the first map, that is giving a taste of these experiences. Now, you do find, and I actually did a research study on, on uh, advanced meditation teachers who had used psychedelics and still use them occasionally. And they universally, they agreed, yes, these, these substances can be useful if used in the context of a, of a spiritual practice. Mm. If used just by themselves, they can be really tricky and dangerous. But if used carefully in the context of a spiritual practice, then yes, they can facilitate spiritual development. So that was an interesting conclusion that these people offered. I believe in Colorado, they just passed mushrooms as a medicinal option yeah. do you uh, are changing things are changing right and you know i've heard you know joe rogan the biggest podcaster in the world he, he's a huge advocate of magic mushrooms and and uh, uh having these experiences yeah, unfortunately you know hopefully the war on drugs is winding down some it's been one of the most it's been the longest and least effective war that this country has waged and cost tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people you know, many, many years in prisons, or in some cases, quite minor offenses. So hopefully that's changing. Yeah, and you, and you hear stories of, 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 you know, someone that's like really depressed, you know, I think I saw a documentary, I think it's on Netflix, I forgot the name of it, but there was this kid, he was really depressed, he was contemplating suicide, but instead of committing suicide, he decided to go to South America and find a shaman and do ayahuasca. And it was yeah. that experience that turns his life around. Yeah, there's no question that for the right person at the right time, in the right setting, with the right guidance, these substances can uh, be helpful. And we also need to acknowledge the other side, you know, as with any really powerful, uh, anything really powerful, they have to be used skillfully and wisely. And if they're not, they can be devastating. And you know, uh, I've treated far too many people on, on psychiatric wards who should never have been using these things and have run into trouble. And so, you know, we need to acknowledge that it's like nuclear power. It can be enormous benefit and may yet destroy the world. So. So, likewise, we need to be very use that very wisely. Psychedelics need, need to be used very wisely too. And sometimes they're not, unfortunately. If they could experience a satori naturally, they wouldn't want the plant-based substances anymore, would they? Well, maybe. Uh, you know what I found in my research with uh, advanced meditation teachers, all of whom had had very profound awakenings. Uh, they found that they were occasion the, the psychedelics were occasionally still useful. Uh, they didn't use them often, but occasionally they found that uh, it was a way which they could. Uh, and remember, these people had done a lot of meditation and, and practice that they could clear a lot of stuff away very quickly and uh, touch again into some of the deepest places they'd touched, and they found that. Uh, helpful and uh, motivating and empowering. Uh, 
but again, they did them in the context of practice and they did them sparingly. I'm reminded of one of your elder peers, uh, Dr. Richard Alpert, who became Ram Das, did lots of psychedelics, him and Mr. Leary, I believe, in the 60s. And I'm reminded of the story of him going to India and meeting this Indian mystic, his, his, his master, and him bringing the master LSD. The master did the LSD and nothing happened. <laughs> it just didn't affect the guy at all. Like everybody was looking, like waiting for something to happen and it was just normal. Well, what the teacher, whose name was Neem Karoli Babur, said at the end was, yes, this can give you the, the vision of Christ, but it is better to become the Christ. Yes. Well, I once told somebody, and I don't know if my analogy is correct or not, but I like to play with analogies. They're kind of fun. But, you know, somebody came to me and was like, you know, what about mushrooms? What about ayahuasca? And I was like, well... It's kind of like having sexual relations with a hooker. <laughs> or you can have sexual relations with a loving partner. And the loving partner would be meditation, contemplation, and having these experiences happen naturally and elevate yourself versus taking something that is quick, easy, cheap maybe is a word, I don't know, but... That that was my on the spot analogy. I don't know if it's perfect, but yeah, probably not perfect. But probably has a point. <laughs> <laughs> when you discovered that there was an ocean underneath the the top of the wave, what's your story? Where did you go with that? Did you start a practice? Did you end up having experiences? Well, I was pretty blown away. I, you know, I came from Australia and uh, was a hardcore neuroscientist at that time, finished my medical degree, had a PhD and an MD, you know, I'd just done the mainstream thing. So I was, and I was doing psychiatry training and just, I just went into psychotherapy figuring I had a moral obligation to try some for myself since I was doing it on people. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I got way more than I bargained, and it was totally life-changing. I, uh, I realized that I had just underestimated or been completely oblivious to the inner universe that all of us, uh, all of us are. And so that began me on a, a quest. My life changed direction, and instead of exploring the brain, I was much more interested in exploring the mind and uh, hidden potentials. And so being in California, I dove into <laughs> everything California has to offer, and mm. you name it, I did it. S, Tarika, T, A, T, M. <laughs> I just ran through the list of list of uh, trainings and workshops and programs that were available. I think there was for a year I spent practically every weekend, bar about three, in a workshop <laughs> of some kind. So I really did it, and then I gradually gradually found myself gravitating towards uh, spiritual track traditions, and I couldn't find figure out why the hell I was uh, being attracted to these religions because I knew at that time was religion was the opiate of masses and a full relic of primitive thinking, and I just was deeply puzzled because as I tried these practices, they seemed to be beneficial. And I just couldn't figure it out. And I really wrestled with this, and it was literally one moment when I was crossing the living room floor. And I realized that at the heart of the world's religions, behind the traditional institutions and the myths and rituals and dogmas, were these far less well-known esoteric programs for training the mind and cultivating capacities and states of consciousness similar to the ones the founders realized. And that the founders had discovered these practices and these states and these insights and left us maps of both how to get there and how the mind looks and how the world looks 
from those positions, they've left contemplative traditions, they've left transpersonal psychologies, and they've left transpersonal philosophies. Mm. All of these were available, but you had to be kind of open to them and looking for them to be, for them to register and make sense. So that just totally changed my life. And the day after I got tenure, I applied for two years, leave of absence to disappear into a monastery in Burma and, and meditate. So I um, didn't stay there for two years, but I did, did uh, do about a year and a half of uh, intensive practice. So, uh, and then fortunately, being in psychiatry, I've been able to meld those worlds of personal experience and personal exploration of these practices with uh, traditional research and uh, intellectual analysis of them. And my work has basically been to try and make sense of these practices and traditions in contemporary terms and language and concepts and in terms of Western psychology so that Western psychology and these contemplative traditions can speak to and understand and appreciate each other and play my small part in bringing these two great traditions together and making, making, creating this, uh, this novel synthesis that is occurring in our time, which we are the beneficiaries of. We are the first generation that has the possibility of drawing on the best of the world's contemplative traditions, the wisdom carried through centuries from the, some of the greatest minds and hearts the human species has ever created, and blending and merging those with some of the greatest psychological explorers of uh, contemporary times. Plus, of course, uh, contemporary scientific research. So we're bringing these three strands together, uh, or people are bringing them together for the first time in history in a, in, and just giving us the possibility of a far more comprehensive understanding of human nature, human potential, problems, pitfalls, and potentials. Not only did you go into a monastery, but you went to Southeast Asia. <laughs> yes, and, and survived. <laughs> wow. It was, a, it was a challenging challenging time. I'm not a gifted meditator, but, but I have benefited greatly from it. Oh, I would imagine so. What is the Gnostic intermediaries and what does it require? Well, Gnostic intermediary was a term introduced by Carl Jung, who you referenced earlier, Kevin. And he referred to it for a text that uh, he also referenced. He referred to uh, the translator of, the, of uh, the Golden Flower, Wilhelm, and called him a Gnostic intermediary. And by what that he meant, someone who imbibes the wisdom of tradition so deeply that they can speak out of directly out of their own experience into the language and concepts of, the, of another culture. And Jung never developed the concept much, but I think we can say that a Gnostic intermediary is someone who is able to transmit the wisdom and understanding of one culture or one era to another. And so, and that seems to require three tasks. The Gnostic intermediary first has to imbibe the wisdom of the original culture or original era and learn the language and concepts and maps of the cultural community they're trying to communicate to. And then out of their own experience, see how to translate the insight, their insights and understandings into that other language and culture so as to create an aha experience. So it makes sense. And so it, it explains and legitimates this wisdom, which before may have made no sense to people whatsoever. Mm. So it's a very important role. And Gnostic intermediaries have been required throughout history, but now they're required in two different ways. First, because we have these, contempt, these traditions, contemplative, philosophical, psychological traditions of the, of the East, coming from India, from China, from the Middle East, uh, entering the West and, and touching it very deeply. And we have the revival of our own Western traditions, the, the contemplative dimensions of Christ, contemplative Christianity, Kabbalah and 
and the other elements of Judaism. We have Sufism in Islam. So these traditions are also calling to be explored, and there are a number of growing numbers of people in the West who are exploring them. So we need Gnostic intermediaries who can translate both from East to West and from ancient to modern. And actually, this is the first time in history, you know, there have been throughout history traditions such as Buddhism have transmitted first from India, say, then to Sri Lanka on the one hand, or in Tibet, to China, and then Japan. So they've crossed cultures. But this is the first time in history that a tradition has had not only across cultures, but to cross eras. These, these Eastern contemplative traditions were born in agrarian times. And now they have to be translated not only into modern, but into postmodern terms and understandings, or even metamodern understandings. So it, what's required of Gnostic intermediaries is to be able to translate across cultures and to translate across eras. Wilhelm. Didn't he end up having some psychological mental health issues eventually? Well, I'm not aware of that. It's possible, but I don't know that. Okay. So he also did the I Ching, right? He did. Yeah. So he did quite a bit. Yeah, he was a he was a pioneer and uh, and really uh, offered some new understandings and insights. And uh, later translators like Cleary today would say. Eh, translations were yeah but you know, he was working with what he had at the time and that's the nature of progress you know today's today's work hopefully is better than yesterday's and hopefully tomorrow's will be better than our work yeah the secret of the golden flower that book was that was that was heavy <laughs> <laughs> not a beginner yeah, book a classic i'm sorry what was that i said not a beginner's book um, not a beginner's book no it's very well, one of the troubles with Taoism is some of the texts and some of the tradition can be very uh, deeply symbolic and not really intended for uh, full transmission except in a living relationship with a teacher who can unpack some of the symbols. So, so Taoism, sort of Jewish Kabbalah can be very heavily symbolic and very hard for someone who's not in the tradition and doesn't have a tradition, a teacher in the tradition to understand. Absolutely. That's why we got Zen, nice and simple. Although the, the cones, you know, <laughs> you know, hearing one hand clapping is a whole. And that'll bend your mind, which is the purpose, of course. Yeah. Or break it's... your mind or dissolve the mind, dissolve the intellect temporarily so you can see what's beyond it. Mm. So what do you tell someone who comes to you and says, I, they, they want to get into mysticism. They, they want to follow the, uh, the path. I call it the peace path. There's many names for it. What's your advice for that person? Well, I find that most people come inquiring about a particular kind of practice. Right. And these days it's usually meditation or yoga. Uh, sometimes it's uh, someone wanting to explore the contemplative side of their own Western tradition, uh, Christian contemplation, for example, centering prayer in Christianity is a very common and wonderful practice. Uh, for someone from uh, Islam, it may be someone who's interested in Sufism. So usually I find it's people who really want to get into a practice. And then the question is, well, how, how do I start and where do I start? And my question is usually, okay, well, what, what, what do you know about these and what attracts you? Are you drawn to a particular practice? Because if you're drawn to one, then go for it. That's the most obvious thing. And if they are, then you know, fine. If they're not, then the uh, question, okay, well, what's, what's simple to begin with? And for very simple practices, I, I think two that can be recommended are, uh, well, three actually. One, if a person is Christian, then centering prayer is wonderfully simple, uh, potentially very profound, very beautiful, heart opening. Uh, for people who are interested in something Eastern, then perhaps uh, 
insight or vipassana meditation, the Buddhist practice, or if people can afford it, because it can be a little expensive, TM, Transcendental Meditation, is very simple, very effective. And so that can be that can be great. The price can be a little steep, but if people can afford it, that's a that's a great way in. Uh, and then after a while, maybe people will be interested in trying something else and and there can be a rhythm to spiritual life. At first you kind of look around and what do I want and choose one and then dive into it for a while. And then maybe after a while you'll feel like, oh, well, I'd like to, I've been doing awareness, you know, I've been really looking, insight, meditation, vipassana. I feel like I'd like to open my heart. Maybe there's some, some, uh, some heart meditations or chanting or prayers that would, would touch and open my heart. So, so, and uh, generally what I suggest to people is, well, ask, you know, find out as much as you can, but also trust your own felt sense of what draws you, what, what pulls, what opens your heart. So where can people come find you? Where can they come see your work? Well, I think the easiest way is to just take a look at my website, drrogerwalsh.com, and there are a lot of articles and talks and, and some dialogues such as this one uh, available there or, or links to them. So there's a lot of free things if they're interested in diving deeper than uh, some of my books and they can find information on those on the website too. So I think that's the easiest way. Well, I really appreciate your time and all your introspective uh, insights and all this. This is great. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. It's a delight to talk with you and explore these things with you. And also, uh, you're giving me a gift in having a chance to get some of these ideas out. So thanks very much. If you'd like to support this podcast so we can continue to give it to the public for free, I want to ask you to kindly consider becoming a patron. All you do is go to patreon.com and sign up for Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. There'll be a link below as well to get there faster. I also want to ask you to share this recording with someone that needs to hear it. And I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.